Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to the Northeast Georgia History Center. We have a great members live stream for you today, or at least I think so. This is a really fascinating topic, something I've had some interest in for some time and wanted to share it with you. So today, when we want to talk to a friend or let a, a business partner know something going on, we send an email, we send a text, we pick up the phone. It's instantaneous. It's personal and yet quite impersonal. It's so informal as to almost be uh, thoughtless. That is not the way things were in the days when communication was much more slow. It was much more intimate. It was much more thoughtful, much more deliberate. When people wanted to talk to each other and they were not in the same room or could not ride uh, close by to see each other, they of course would have to write a letter. And that's something that we don't really teach in schools. Of course, as some of you know, we don't even really have cursive in some schools anymore. And that, that just bugs me. I'll tell you why we have we should have cursive and why cursive came to be in a second. But you have to go back to a time, and it was not that long ago, when people, when they wanted to tell someone something, when they wanted to inquire after something, when they wanted to order something from a business, they had to sit down at a desk they had to bring the, the tools of the time together, and they actually had to think about what they wanted to say. They actually had to, ahead of writing, say, well, what am I going to say? How am I going to say it? it depending upon how formal the relationship was, they might have to phrase things in a certain way. And the mechanics of what they were going to do, the paper they write on, the ink they use, the, the pens, the quills that they use are also part of that process that that's almost lost to us today. But I want to sort of walk you through what it was to actually write a letter to someone, uh, some of the tools that we have uh, from the 18th and really early 19th century. Almost everything I'm going to be talking to you about is universal throughout the entire 18th century and really on up until about 1820 to 1830. Even though I'm dressed as a, as a late uh, 18th century person, all this sort of stuff, the tools, the approaches and how they do things is going to be universal. So you've decided to write a letter to someone. How do you write it? How do you phrase it? Well, of course, at first, the first thing is, as I said, to, to be thinking about it. There were actually how-to books. Uh, one very famous one is called Letters to and for a Particular Friend. And it was a great big book, and it basically had samples. It had form letters you could use for a wide variety of, of objects. Someone... Uh, whom you would like to court, a business partner, how to order something from a business, uh, how to chastise an ungrateful son. That's one of the things that's in there, things like that. So it would sort of give you a form and, and people who had access to this could therefore pull it off of the shelf and use it sort of as a template to follow the social and cultural mores and traditions of the time. But a lot of people are going to have done this and, and they're going to sit down with writing equipment and begin it. Now, let me back up a little bit and say, this is why writing and reading were so important, not typing because people had to communicate. Uh, children would learn to read, they be, would begin learning to read about age four or five, anywhere from six to seven years old. Learning to write wouldn't come until a little bit later until they were about eight, nine, 10. This is because they had to have the developed motor skills to actually work the actual equipment. So I want to write a letter. How am I going to do that? Well, first, of course, I need to get some paper. And there are different kinds of paper. The paper is different uh, in this time period than it is today. Uh, today, we just, if we want to print something out, we just grab some classic eight and a half by 11. That seems to be the standard size. And it's very, very common. It's made from trees. This is this is one of the, the things. Because it's made from trees, paper is incredibly cheap. Books are incredibly cheap, but not so back in the day. Paper was not like super expensive, but it was enough of an expense that people would not just waste it. And paper was laid. I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to try to bring this up. We have a camera here today uh, to see this. I even have a, a, a modern thing. Let me see if I can, it can work this and get a little close. You can perhaps see some lines in the paper uh, because the way the paper was made, it was a uh, rag, like cotton or linen rag uh, in water that was all super, super ground up. And then it was laid on like a wire mesh grate. 
very, very small, but it was nevertheless laid on it, and that's why it's called laid paper. You can still find this today. Oftentimes, it also has a watermark. There were different sizes of paper. So regular old, old paper that you would get was like this. It's about 8 by 10 rather than 8.5 by 11. The reason it's this size is because paper tended to come in big sheets and standard sizes. For, and I want to show you what I mean. So here's an example of a newspaper from the late 1700s. This is a, a newspaper size sheet. And so the sheets that you're going to have are going to be about a fourth of that. And so they're going to cut it to the size. That's how you end up with an 8 by 10. You also have something a little bit longer. Uh, this, is a, this is something that would be used for more formal writing. If you were writing to someone you didn't quite know, if you were writing a, a legal document or something like that, you would use this sort of paper. This is a little bit bigger. Uh, it's about like 8 by 13. This is where we get our legal size today. Of course, our legal size is 8.5 by 14, but, but it's close to that, and you can, see, you can see the differences. Now, there are also uh, some different choirs. This is, this is about the same size, that 8.5 by 10, but it actually has a fold in it, you can see, sort of like a book. And so what you would do is you would write your introduction here on this first page, you would open it up. You would then write on the inside both pages and leave the back blank. You, you, even when you're writing a letter, you always leave the back blank. We'll come to that. So I have, um, I have chosen my paper here. And if I'm at home, I could write on a, on a flat surface like this. But if I'm traveling, I'm going to have a couple of different tools. I may have a traveling writing desk. Uh, but we may need, want to go to the close-up for this just a little bit so that you can see it. Um, you, this has a thing you can open here. There's an inkwell here. And then this... Oh, no! <laughs> That's hilarious. That was unanticipated. What should be here is, a, uh, is green uh, wool. It was usually beige green. Um, and that would provide you an angled writing surface so that you could... You could take this and you would be able to write on this angled writing surface. You would be able to, to access your, your inkwell here, dip in like that, and write your letter thusly. Um, sometimes you would, you would have these at home as well. And, and inside, you can uh, it would open up and there would be lots of room on the inside for your writing equipment, for your ink, for more quills, for things like that. Now... Sometimes even that was too big. Let's say you needed something that you could just stick into your pocket. Well, perhaps something like this. This is a, uh, we could go to the, to the close up. This is just a small uh, tin item, sort of a tube, and you can take the top off like that. And lo and behold, look at that. It's a little more portable writing set. You have a, uh, a porta crayon, which I'll get to, I'll get to that in a second, which has some, some lead in there. And then you have a quill. I put a little piece of, uh, of cork on there to protect it and a little, little tiny bottle made into the tin that you can dip, uh, dip your quill in there and do your writing for that. A very, very small uh, but very, very effective means. And then the tin closes up and that can just go in your pocket. Very, very handy to have something like that to write with. Now, all that to say, that's sort of the things. And, and of course, the quill is the most common type of writing instrument, right? This is usually a, a goose quill is the most common. And you would have to carve this into a very precise point. And almost uh, all gentlemen would have a pen knife. Now, this is not a, a regular pocket knife. This is very specifically made to cut a quill. Later on, when we don't have to, to carve uh, goose feathers into pens, it's still going to be called a pen knife just because it has a small blade, but here it really, really is a pen knife. You see that the blade is, uh, is relatively small. It's got this little sharp point at the end, and you would have to cut this into this way, and then you would have to trim the sides of it, and then you're going to have to put a little bitty cut in the front to make a little nib. And, uh, sorry, that's going to have to make a, uh, a little shape, a very special little shape. And you notice this particular one doesn't have any feathers, uh, the, the veins on the end. That's because those tended to get in the way. Sometimes they would keep those on. Sometimes they would leave them long. Sometimes they would cut them half the way off. 
because they're not really the point. The point haha, <laughs> is to actually just have something convenient to write with. And you would use a pen knife to keep that sharp. Now, I also have a, a couple of different quills here and a couple of different inkwells. I have a ceramic inkwell here. And uh, you can see this is just made of, uh, like I said, ceramic uh, that you could keep the ink in. But some places, a, a gentleman's desk or something like that, is also going to have this nice pewter piece. And it has three small holes here that the, uh, the quill can go in like this. And it has a cool little opening thing. And down inside is a little reservoir for the ink. So you can put some ink there. You can keep your quill safe. Close this up. When you're done, you're done. When you're not, you can um, open this up and begin your writing. So how do you write a letter? Part of the, uh, the dibble dabble, the dipping the quill into the ink, uh, you have to get some on it. And usually what's going to happen is when you write this, you want to put information on it. You want to put uh, where you're at. You want to put what the date is because remember, this is a three mile an hour world. In the three mile an hour world, the letters may pass each other in the post back and forth. And, there, and, and sometimes you could be writing, say, a letter uh, to a friend or a wife every single day, but you're not going to put that in the post every day. So when it comes time to uh, put the letters in the post, you may have a big stack of three, four, five, ten letters that will all go at once. And so what will happen is you will want to date these so that people will know what order to read them in and you'll know what they received. And so let's say that I've gotten a letter uh, from a from a friend. Uh, I want to put here. So I will begin it with, uh, we'll, uh, now Gainesville did not exist in uh, 1780, but we're going to pretend that it did. I'll dip this in here. Get, get just a little bit of ink there. And so I'll put Gainesville, Georgia. Dip this in as often as necessary. Today is November 20. Let's say it's 1790. We have a new president in Washington, George Washington. Now, then I will begin to my friend that this is to. Dear Madam, I received your letter of the eighth instant. Now, what does instant mean? That means of this month. So if you look up here, you'll see that it's November. You must have written this letter on the eighth. That's the one I'm referring to. If it was uh, the eighth previous, that, of course, would mean, uh, for example, October. That would be October 8th. Um, was so delighted to hear your good, oh, you see my quill starting to run out of ink. I just dip it back over there. News. I'm not going to write an entire letter. That would get sort of boring. I remain yours, etc. Then maybe I want to put a little flourish down here next to my name. And that's it. And then I can return my quill to the inkwell. And then um, I can set here, I can let the ink dry. I, of course, can blow on it. If I'm in a terrible rush and I've been rather messy, there's something called pounce. Um, it's a lot like sand, but it's basically pumice. And you, you would sprinkle this, like this, over the letter. And you would sort of roll that sand around and it would soak up all the loose ink. And then I would just open the container back up if I didn't make too big a mess and put that back in. And then theoretically all the ink is uh all the ink is dried. So, yes, a writing uh writing desk could become a quite messy place. So now I have the letter written. I've thought about it. 
I have uh, used all the, uh, the quaint and important uh, formulas for writing to someone. Do I put it in an envelope? I do not. I do not put it in an envelope. Um, the letter itself is going to become an envelope. And so here's what I'm going to do. You will uh, take one side, you will fold it in, perhaps a, a quarter of an inch. You can take a, a bone folder or something like this and get the, that crease really nice and strong. You'll do the same on the other side, right, like this. And then so both sides are turned in like this. Now you'll turn up this side. You can see where I'm going with this. Turn up this side, fold that over, but not too tight because you're about to see something really neat. And then fold this over to overlap just a little bit. All right? And then what you want to do is sort of fold it, like, like push this into it, into the edge. I don't know if you can sort of see what I'm doing there. Sort of goes into it there on that side and then goes into it that way so it sort of folds on itself. And that is of course put in there. And then that's that way. Now, I'm going to uh, use a piece of modern technology. I hope you'll forgive me. Because we want to see how do we seal this, right? We, we want to actually seal this so that it doesn't come open so that the recipient knows that no one has pried into their mail. Believe it or not, that used to be um, something that was a, a problem. The Postal Service, especially if it was a famous person or a political opponent, they had no, uh, usually, sometimes, had no compunctions whatsoever about breaking into the mail and seeing what the letters were. This was very, very common. You see a lot of uh, newspaper articles at the time, my mail has been opened I'm, and I'm very upset about it. I hope this doesn't happen again. So we're going to seal this with wax. Of course, we're going to use uh, sealing wax. I don't know if how we can get, I don't want to get the candle right in front of that, but I want to show you what we can do. So we have sealing wax here. And then the key is, yeah, let me pull this back just a oh, I need to come forward a little bit. Just a touch, sorry. So this is, uh, it's a kind, it's not just candle wax, it's a special kind of wax. Um, has a little bit of shellac in it, actually. And so you are just trying to heat the end. I could stick this all the way in, and, and it, we may get to that point. This could just catch on fire, so you have to be a little bit careful. Again, in the 18th and 19th centuries, things are a little more slow, things are a little more deliberate. People are not in as big a hurry to get things done. Remember, you've probably just spent 30 minutes to an hour thinking about this letter, composing it, writing it. Uh, so you're not in a big hurry. And a lot of people are going to spend a good part of their day right, writing letters. Thomas Jefferson, when he woke up, he would sometimes write letters for the first three to four hours of his day, reading his correspondence, answering the correspondence. Right? So then we're going to get uh, enough of that melted. Then we're going to put it on that and just sort of wipe it around thusly. Gets a little stringy. And then we're going to take our seal, breathe on it, to put just a little moisture, and hold it on there. That little bit of moisture uh, keeps it from sticking too bad. And that's not a super pretty one, but you can kind of see that uh, I've got a nice seal there, and that's a, that's a good hard plastic. So that is not going to be, you know, very much in our way. There are, um, there are a couple of other ways you can seal it. There's this thing, this cool thing here, that you can put a smaller candle under, and it will heat the wax in the little spoon. And it, you can just pour it onto the letter like that, and then use the seal to put it in. But... But this requires the wax, of course, to be going a lot longer. It takes a little um, longer to get it going. But if you're going to be sitting here writing a lot of letters, that's okay. So, you know, and so your stick of sealing wax, it's already cool to the touch because it, it is almost, it's almost like a plastic. And so we have this here. So we have it, the letter written, we have it sealed. Now we have to address it. All right, so we'll have to... Uh, 
write this down. And of course there are no PO boxes. Uh, this will just go to someone. I think I know who this can go to. This will go to Miss Sue Small. We're going to pretend that she's not too far away. And Savannah. Georgia. And that's it. So that's how you address the letter. Right? You address that letter. And then, how do you mail it? Well, that can become one of those things that's somewhat problematic. Uh, the Postal Service does exist, uh, but it's not always regular, and, it does, and of course not every town has a post office. It's called a post office because it is a post. It is a place where they keep horses and riders so that a group of mail and a bag will come into that post office. Those that are addressed to that post office in that major town or city will be taken out, others will be put in, and then a new rider on a new horse will take off to the next post, post office. And so I may also, if I have a friend going to Savannah or going perhaps to Augusta, I could give this to them and that would get it part of the way and, and people did do this. And then you notice I haven't said anything about paying postage. Well, this is also the thing about the post office until about the, the middle of the 19th century. I don't have to pay postage on this as the sender of the letter. Poor Sue Small is going to have to pay postage when she receives the letter if she wants the letter. So it may actually finally get to her and then she go, do I have any mail at the post office? She will say, and they'll say, yes, I do have a letter for you. And he will look and see how, where it's come from, uh, how much it weighs, and then he will let Sue know how much money she has to pay to get the letter. Uh, I'm sure that Sue would love to have a letter from me, so she'll pay any price. But let's say that she has decided she doesn't want this letter or that it costs too much and that she's not interested in paying it. So it basically goes into a box called the dead letters. And in the dead letter box, the letters will sit there. And they'll just sit there for a while until they are, um, until time has gone by and, and then that's it. So if she's, um, Let's say she's she's gotten, you get a letter like this, you've paid your fee, uh, you've gone to the post office, well, you have your wax seal. So what you'll do, of course, you'll just snap it like this. It breaks the seal. You open the letter up, and then you read the letter. Ah, here's the information, whatever it is, whether uh, it's from a friend, whether it's to let them know they'll be coming to visit you, whether it's placing an order with a merchant, things like that. Uh, sometimes they might even enclose money or a letter of credit if, if they're needing to send money one place to the other. The problem is, of course, with a, uh, folks in the post office opening the mail, that might become problematic if you just send cash or if you send a letter of credit. That might be a little, a little safer. But that is how writing a letter and working uh, in the post works, is sealing the, folding those letters and sealing those letters and things like that. Now, that is just one aspect of writing. That's the one we usually think of. We want to sit and write letters. Uh, they write letters to friends. But there's also a lot more to writing. This is how folks keep records. This is how folks communicate with each other. This is how they take notes. They want to keep journals and everything like that. Um, there are also books, right? This one is called The Young Clerk's uh, Assistant or Penmanship Made Easy, Instructive Learning and Entertainment, being a complete pocket copy, curiously engraved for the practice of youth in the art of writing. They sure made titles better back then, didn't they, if somewhat long. So there are lots of examples of books of practicing your penmanship. And a young gentleman especially is going to spend hours a day practicing their penmanship to make it uh, rolling and flowing, very distinct, very easy to read, very rounded. Um, I don't know if, let me see if I can, if the camera will pick it up. It gives you instructions on how to hold it and how you may want to write your letters. And you can see what the expectations are here uh, with what the script will look like, very rounded, very clear cut. This was the ideal, right? This was not always the case. When you look at some, some letters, even by some of our founding fathers, 
It did not look like that. George Washington had a beautiful hand, beautiful round, because he had practiced as a young man because he wanted to get into that Virginia elite, and he had to make sure he did all the things that a Virginia elite planter was supposed to be able to do. One of those was right beautifully. Now, Thomas Jefferson was a Virginia planter as well, but you'll find his hand isn't quite as round, but it is incredibly neat and refined. John Adams... Uh, his hand, you can read it, but it is not what you would call graceful by any means. You can tell he's trying to write as fast as he can so that his hand can keep up with how fast his brain is going. And that flowing script, remember, you're having to use this quill and keep the ink flowing as you write. That's why we have cursive, ladies and gentlemen, so that the, the ink and the pen can t continue to go. Block letters are not that common in this period. They're perhaps put on large packages, or to introduce um, certain legal documents up at the top. But by and large, this, this hand, this what we call cursive, that's the universal writing so that they can keep that flow going. Now, <clears throat> having the ink, having to travel with it, having to keep the quills, having to keep the quills trimmed, if you need to seal a letter sealing it, that seems like a lot of trouble for writing things. Necessary for letters, but what if I just want to make some notes? Well, of course, um, there's always this thing, right? There are small chalkboards that are not just for children, they're slate boards, and they could take a piece of chalk or slate and make notations on it. They might even make a first draft of a letter on something like this, because you're not using paper, you're not using ink, you're just writing it down, and if you don't like it, it's easy to, to change a word here and there and go back and have, because remember, again, paper is expensive, but you can't just use it up and throw it away, and you certainly can't recycle it like we do now. You're going to want something that you can just take notations on. Say, for example, you're out in the farm, and you're counting the number of pigs and chickens you have. Well, you want to get that notation right, so you'll take this in, then you'll go inside, and then you'll make your notations with pen and ink. It's also very common to have a variety of books that you may have, um, small books that you might write things in. It was very common to have a common book. Uh, someone might find a passage from a piece of literature that they that struck them particularly. They may they might want to know uh, record the prices, record uh, what pieces of property they own. So they're going to just write these down in a bound book like this and keep it on their person to make notes with and things like that. They might also just have a really basic book, right, of just, of just paper, just blank paper so that they can take notes. But again, this is going to be a quasi-permanent record of what they're keeping because paper's expensive. If you're a gentleman, of course, it's not that expensive. Some folks might even have something really neat like this. We can take a closer look at this. It's just a looks like a, a leather note case. looks like a wallet, and that's exactly what it is. So you open this up, and you're going to have some, some places over here where you could put some, some papers, uh, maybe some clippings from a uh, newspaper, or some of your money even. Over here, here's, this one happens to have a small piece of paper in it, and a small place for a little porta crayon. Now, I haven't mentioned porta-crayons yet. They seem like the logical thing to us because they're, like I said, they're lead or they're graphite. And you can make notes, you know, one chicken, one cow. And I'm writing that with a porta-crayon. But when you look at that, even on the camera up close, it's, it's not incredibly easy to make that out. Um, not as easy, certainly, as it is with, with pen and ink. So this, this is a much more temporary Thing. So that's one reason people don't use porta-crayons as a permanent way of writing. You see it sometimes. You see people might want to write a letter or something uh, like that with a porta-crayon, but it's not permanent. Weather's going to get to it. It's not going to be uh, something that's easily readable and something like that. And I have a couple of more examples here, like this long one. You do see this, but 90% of the time, even though this seems like a good idea to us who are very used to, to using pencils to write with, this is usually an artist tool. You're going to see folks when they're sketching 
or drawing or something like that, you're going to, you know, the portraits you see are going to be sitting here and they're going to be holding it like this and they're going to be sketching or writing or using shading. That's great for this sort of thing, but writing notes only in a very temporary, quick way, nothing permanent. Now, something, um, when you, when you keep these notes, when you keep these things, you're going to want to travel with them too. And so you're going to have a couple of things like a, a large leather portfolio, right? You can take this, you can keep your drawings, you can keep your letters, lots of things in this. And you can carry it under your arm if you have papers you're going to, a, bless your heart, an 18th century meeting or something like that. You, some of them roll up to go on the back of a horse or to go on something like that. Let's say I have some of those letters. And I want to uh, keep them safe. I don't want them to get wet. I can put them in a small tin thing like this. They go inside there. That seals up. And I can put this in a saddlebag. Uh, I can even carry it around like this. The idea being it protects them. A little bit of waterproof. Keeps them from being crushed. So these little uh, tin document holders, T-I-N, tin document holders, are also something that's very, very common. Now, um, something else too, since paper is so expensive, if I need to, say say you come to me and you purchase um, two chickens and a hog, for some reason I'm stuck on livestock today, but work with me. Uh, if you purchase two chickens and a hog and want a receipt, I'm not gonna use this big piece of paper to do that. Why would I waste an entire piece of paper? And this, this is very common. So perhaps I would take this and I would just cut, take a small pair of scissors and cut something lengthwise. And then, you know, have something, you know, Libba bought two chickens on November 20th, 1790 for, well, I'm going to charge her a lot, for <laughs> six shillings. There we go. So now she has a receipt that those chickens are hers. And I just fold that up and I give it to her. There's her receipt. I'm not gonna use a whole sheet of paper for something like that. And then she's gonna wad this up, put this in a, in a small wallet, something like that, and she's gonna take that home and keep that as a record. That's why it's so interesting when you, when you start looking through these account books of, of businessmen and farmers and you see these, these images, if they exist, and there are a couple that are really cool of what their desk look like. There are just sheets of paper stuck everywhere, tied up. They're all different shapes. They're all different sizes because that's their record keeping system, right? They have to keep what was given to them and there wasn't really an argument about standard paper sizes or anything like that. But these papers are going to be the main ways people communicate with each other. And, and you have to think about that. How important writing was in the 18th century. All the great works of uh, literary art uh, are political documents. Uh, the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson wrote a draft of that, which then for two days the Continental Congress argued over, scratched through, added new things. It's all writing. It's, it's all right there, and it's a very deliberate process. It's a very poetical process, really. And as you can see, even mechanically, it's a pretty complex process. But it, for those who were men of letters, who did have the capability and the knowledge uh, to write uh, well and communicate with each other and send their ideas across a state line, across a mountain range, or even across an ocean or a continent, that was the way that everyone knew and learned about the world. It was very slow, but it was very deliberate. And when people sat down to speak to someone else via the written word, it was something that they put a lot of thought and a lot of effort into. And, and again, we don't even think about that today. When we sit down and we need to check with someone, 
we'll send a text with you know emojis and shortened words and abbreviations or emails that we just dash off because it's so easy to, to get them out and it's done. Not so in the 18th century. So if you have a chance, I encourage you, even if it's a small thing, even if you just want to sit down with a piece of paper, take up a modern ballpoint pen, that's okay, and write that letter out to someone, put it in an envelope and mail it to them. Can you imagine what that's going to do to their day to get an actual handwritten note from a friend or a loved one in the mail? And you can even do them a favor today of paying the postage so that they don't have to. So I don't know how much time I have left, a little bit, but I do want to open it up to see if anyone has any questions about any of this stuff or about the process of writing and communicating. Uh, ben from Homeschool Connection is watching and wants to know, uh, where can you purchase these things in the time you are in? So he wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Ben. So there are uh, probably the best one-stop shop is a place called Townsend's. Uh, they have a great website, and they have a lot of these um, writing implements and things. Not some of the fancier ones, but they do have ink. Uh, they do have quills. They do have the right kind of paper. They, they have um, sealing wax and seals and things like that. So, and actually, that's, I believe this is, this is where I got this little traveling ink stand. But if, if you want to just go to a one-stop shop and get the basics, Townsend's is probably the best place. Prior to the Pony Express, uh, how were letters delivered outside of your local area? All right, so they were delivered to the various post office. Letters were never delivered to a home or to a business, right? They were delivered respectfully to the post office. And the post office, as you can imagine, in this time period, it's all, nothing moves faster than a horse. And there aren't a whole lot of post offices, but they are in most major cities or towns up and down uh, the United States. So a letter could take a great long time to get where it was going, if it, especially if it was a long, not a common route. So i um, trying to think of a great example. Let's, well, I mean, let's, let's take Georgia, for example. Let's say that someone uh, lived in the, in the back country of Georgia a little bit after the revolution, but the nearest post office was Augusta. And so when someone writes them a letter, they're going to know, hopefully, that the closest big city is Augusta, Georgia. So even if that person doesn't live in Augusta, that's where the letter goes. And the letter is, and once it arrives via the, you know, it may go from Philadelphia all the way down to, to Williamsburg and here and there. And it finally gets to the post office where it's addressed. Once it's there, it sits there until the recipient comes to see if they have any mail. They will simply walk in and say, do you have any mail for so-and-so? Or for my neighbor so-and-so, I'm going that way. And so they would then have to get those letters, pay for those letters. That's how they would get them. So again, no home delivery. Uh, and it's not very precise, right? Um, that's why the mail service in this time was very tricky. Our, our good friend Benjamin Franklin, when he was postmaster in the American colonies, um, he didn't only want to do it because it, it made him good money, which it did, but he was also obsessed with the idea of making it more efficient and making it more uh, affordable for everyone. And he achieved that. It took, you know, it took months and months sometimes for a letter, for example, to go from Charleston, South Carolina to Philadelphia. He fixed it so that that only, only took about three to four weeks for that letter to get from one place to the other. Again, Seems like a lot nowadays, but when you compare it to three to four months versus three to four weeks, that is a huge improvement. I think that's all we've got. Is that all we've got right now? Okay. Well, thanks for tuning in, everyone, uh, to the members live stream here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. It's always a pleasure, always fun. We appreciate so much what the members do to help us keep all these great programs going and to help us keep our doors open. So... We appreciate you. Thank you very much. We've got lots of great stuff. Keep an eye on Facebook and on our website for all the things we, uh, the programs we have coming up. We've got something really fun uh, planned for the very first uh, weekend in December, so keep your eyes open. And until we see you next time, stay safe and take care. Mm -hmm.